Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Friday, May 15th. We are joined today by the Yukon Premier, Sandy Silver, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have one question plus one follow-up. Because of the importance of today's announcement, we will entertain a second round of questions. Again, you will be called by name. Our French-speaking journalists are encouraged to ask their questions in French. With us today is André Boursier from the French Language Services Directorate to translate those questions for those who do not speak French. Thank you. Premier Silver? Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we are releasing a path forward, uh, Yukon's COVID-19 recovery plan. Uh, this is Yukon's plan for lifting COVID-19 restrictions and the plan outlines how we are looking at easing restrictions and setting the roadmap for our eventual return to a new normal. I'm very happy to share this document with Yukoners today. This plan includes a number of phases, including the response phase, which is uh, the phase that we've been in for the last several weeks, the restart phase, which begins today, the recovery phase, and then a new normal phase. The transition, from one phase to another will be based on meeting cri certain criteria meant to minimize risk and to ensure that we are proceeding in a way that protects public health at each and every step. As I said, we are pleased to now officially be beginning phase one, the restart phase. In the plan, you will find a number of details about phase one that will now begin to be implemented in the next coming days and weeks. It doesn't all start today, but as of today, we can start. So what does phase one mean for Yukoners? It means that we are moving further ahead with opening guidelines for businesses and organizations. Now we have already added guidelines for allied health professionals, optometrists, and retail businesses recognizing that childcare is key to people being able to return to work. We have also developed guidelines for summer camps so that they uh, can continue their operational plans for the summer. Guidelines for daycares and day homes are being finalized and will come out very, very soon. We are entering into phase one. Uh, as we are entering into phase one, our goal is to loosen public health measures while keeping Yukoners safe and healthy, we are working to get businesses that were mandated to close the supports that they need to open back up where appropriate. We do know that some will remain closed into later phases, but those that can open safely, we want them back up and running. These include personal services and restaurants. Personal services and restaurants will need to develop an operational plan and have that plan approved by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and his team. Officials are available to help businesses develop these plans and will work with them to review them as quickly as possible. There is a template available as we speak on yukon.ca that can help you to develop these plans. Now, if your business was not mandated to close and is in a position to operate safely, you also will need a development, uh, to develop an operational plan, but you do not need approval of that plan before you open. Again, there are officials who can help you out with this plan if you want to, and uh, they, you can follow the templates that are available on yukon.ca. For Yukoners in general, it means that we will be easier to reconnect with one another, up until now, the recommendation has been to practice physical distancing of at least two meters around anyone that is not a member of your household. Uh, if you're outside, uh, you can still socialize with others uh, outside of your household, providing that you're practicing safe distancing, uh, physical distancing. But we are uh, here to announce as well the household bubble concept, but I'll leave that to Dr. Handley uh, to describe to you. Uh, but uh, safe to say that we are opening up a bit of the, re uh, the provisions for households. Uh, we are heading into another long weekend, 
and uh, and it's a good time for us to be a little bit more uh, able to move amongst Yukoners. While it feels like we've been uh, dealing with COVID-19 related impacts for an absolute long time, we are still on our first steps of a pathway forward. We are able to begin phase one because of the vigilance and precautions of Yukoners. Thank you very much. We would not be here today in phase one if it wasn't for the diligence of all of you. Thank you very much. This vigilant, vigilance must continue uh, if we are going to continue to move past phase one and into phase two, etc. So while we begin to open things up, Yukoners have to continue to practice physical distancing. We all must continue to wash our hands and to stay at home if we are sick, avoid gatherings of more than 10 people. We are still asking people to limit their travel to communities. Uh, to the orders on self-isolation uh, when returning to Yukon and the strict border restrictions, they're still going to be in place uh, for some time. Today we begin phase one. Like any path, we are on our very first steps. There is still a long way to go. We will be using an objective, risk-based approach uh, that will guide our reopening next steps to begin allowing for more flexibility for Yukoners and Yukoners at home. We know that it, it is time to lift these restrictions for the sake of our mental health, for our social and economic well-being, and because it is safe to do so. We also know that there are risks uh, associated with going too fast, like having to turn back the dial and tighten up again. This pathway is not a one-way street. The plan speaks of triggers for moving forward and triggers for an unfortunate step backwards that we all hope that we will not have to take. Our goal is to keep border restrictions and enforcement of our SEMA orders tight so as to allow Yukoners more movement within the territory and enabling greater freedoms and flexibilities for Yukoners at home. Even as we progress through the initial phases of reopening and getting Yukon residents back to work, border controls will remain in place for the time being. This is because uh, import importation of COVID-19 to Yukon is still our greatest risk. Tight borders in Yukon will be with us uh, until transmission in our jurisdictions and other jurisdictions is under control. I want to thank the enforcement officers who are working across the territory to keep people informed and to keep our territory safe. Everyone uh, will, uh, sorry, e even if we begin relaxing health measures and reopening society, it remains a real possibility that strict measures will be needed to be reinstated. This is a marathon, it is not a sprint as we said last week, uh, and we are still in the early phases of this pandemic. Uh, we thank everybody for their cooperation. Uh, what a wonderful place we live in uh, and for making so many sacrifices. Uh, because of the hard work that you have all done, we are able uh, to be in a fortunate position today. So thank you again for your diligence, uh, your commu commitment to safety. Uh, what we are facing as a society is absolutely not easy. It is not comfortable and it is causing considerable stress to Yukoners. Be kind to each other, check in on your friends and your loved ones, have a safe long weekend, sticking close to home, but getting out and enjoying all that the territory has to offer. Thank you very much. Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Danacha, another historic day for Yukon begins as this tumultuous journey we have been on takes another turn, a turn towards life returning to some semblance of normal. So much has changed in our lives since that first week of March when the pandemic invaded our world here in Yukon. But the steps taken that day with the introduction of what became a series of restrictive measures has set Yukon on the right path to protecting its citizens from the sly and fickle spread of COVID-19. 
early on as we tracked the disease around the world and through Canada, and indeed into our own territory, we did not know when we would be able to lift any of the restrictions. So I'm happy to be here today with the Premier as part of the announcement of the plan for how to start lifting COVID-19 restrictions and return our lives to some normalcy. We are only able to do this because of the government's and your adherence to public health advice and direction early on. The swift and strict closure of our borders and mandatory self-isolation of anyone coming into Yukon has helped to keep COVID-19 at bay. Encouraging all of us to stay close to home has also helped, and cooperation from all Yukon citizens has made that possible. Our successful following of those rules means we are now finally able to move progressively to a more accessible and open society, as much as we can afford to while staying safe from the pandemic. On the household bubbles, a household, uh, as, as of now, a household may now choose one other household um, to spend time with without physically distancing. And both households naturally have to agree, agree on that arrangement and not have close contact with anyone apart from these two units. And so that th those two combined units will be known as a, a two-household bubble or double bubble. And members of the household of, uh, may not join up with more than one other household or bubble. So it's a two-household bubble. And of course, this, this is again like all the other measures. It does not mean that the threat has gone. It may be something that we'll have to clamp back down on um, if, if we did see increases in cases. Um, so more guidance on that will be coming out uh, in, time for, in time for the long weekend, so, so some of the more specifics. Um, but, uh, uh, but really that's, that's the... Uh, never far away, and we have seen that when COVID hits, it has no mercy. Death has been very much a part of COVID-19, and we have all watched the national death numbers increase. This week, we were all saddened, I'm sure, to hear of the first nurse to die from COVID-19. That nurse worked in continuing care. As we pointed out on Tuesday, this is National Nursing Week, and in, in addition to everyone else I mentioned earlier this week, nurses in acute care, public health, and community care, I would like to recognize the work of our nurses working in long-term care. Along with all the nursing home attendants, the, the cleaning staff, the cooks, the support staff who work in long-term care. The nurse in Ontario, Brian Beatty, who died from COVID, used to talk about his long-term care residents as his second family. When I think of our five facilities who have been in lockdown for two months, I'm so grateful to our Yukon long-term care staff who have been caring for residents who haven't been able to see their own families. Even more than usual, these dedicated staff have been the family that residents have depended on. Here we are again with another long weekend before us, likely the time when normally we'd be looking to go farther afield, the first summer camping weekend, or a trip over the pass to Skagway or to Haines. Well, once again, this weekend will be different for many of us. Closer to home, maybe more subdued. The borders are still closed, so no trips to Skagway or Haines. No campgrounds are open yet, but you still can enjoy the great outdoors. You can start to get out a little further from home, 
remembering that respectful, safe, and limited travel around Yukon is the direction we are going in. You can start thinking about your next hairstyle and which restaurants you're going to book for when the time comes. Meanwhile, please enjoy your weekend as you can and remember the safe six. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the phone lines now. First, we'll call on Tim from CKRW. <laughs> Good afternoon. A uh, lot to digest here, but with the, the look, trying to look at the plan here online, uh, what kind of what's the difference from what we've already been doing to what we are in phase one? You said phase one begins today, but what are some of the, the hard differences here uh, that you're now presenting today? Well, I think as uh, as Dr. Hanley just pointed out, one of the main considerations it, that is new as of today is uh, is the bubble. Uh, households now uh, can can allow five more people into their household, uh, so that's a major sw shift, uh, and it's a very it's one that we do very cautiously as well, um, and and we want to make sure that uh, we're doing this and we're doing this in the safe way possible. Uh, one of the biggest changes as well is the the requirements for businesses and the ability for businesses to start moving forward to being opened. Um, you know, Yukoners uh, can see where we're going now is major part of this of this plan is just knowing what the phases look like uh, past phase one and into phase two. The triggers, uh, knowing exactly what will trigger us to go forward as opposed to going backwards. But by moving into phase one, we are gradually uh, opening businesses that were mandated to close, which is a major announcement today. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that everything that was closed will automatically open today. Um, it does mean that the guidelines are being developed uh, to support businesses as they prepare to reopen. I had a good chat with uh, the chair of the uh, Business Advisory Council about exactly this, being prepared and being ready, uh, and they were uh, happy to know uh, that we're moving forward uh, for, for that visionary part of it, so that they know what the phase is going to look like, uh, knowing full well uh, that we have to have some operational plans in place. Uh, last week, you saw the uh, the guidelines for the allied health uh, community uh, and massage therapists and the optometrists. And today, we have guidelines for retail operations uh, and summer day camps. Uh, I know that Dr. Hanley and his team are finalizing guidelines uh, for childcare and day homes, uh, personal services, and 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 we also mentioned that we are ready to go forward on the household bubbles. So, uh, lots to announce today. Lots. Uh, lots in this new phase uh, as we go down that road of being prepared to be open. Again, like I said from the beginning, it doesn't all start today, but as of today, it can start. Okay. Follow-up question, Tim? Okay, so it seems like there's no, like you just said, no hard deadlines. Everybody, every single business that wants to reopen will have to submit a plan. Uh, the logistics behind that, like, do you have enough people to go in and have a, a look and cross-reference that with those guidelines so there's no hard date then? Yeah, so so a couple things there. So, <clears throat> you know, the plan is saying that the restrictions will be eased for, let's say, for example, uh, personal care businesses uh, during phase one. So uh, when uh, will they be eased uh, or, uh, or are they uh, allowed to open as of today is a good question. Uh, you know, those restrictions will be eased when the guidelines for safe operations are developed. Uh, so I expect those to be finalized very, very soon, as early as next week. Um, but also, you know, when it comes to those firm deadlines that you talked about, Tim, we, kn we know that recovery and a return to normalcy is on everybody's mind right now, but we absolutely need to keep our communities safe. That's extremely important. It was a big part of our conversation at the Yukon Forum. It's a big part of the conversation as we talk with the municipalities as well. Our approach is based on our ability to meet conditions and criteria and to allowing a minimum time threshold between phases to monitor and to detect those changes and to evaluate those risks. Any significant changes in these periods, well, they're going to determine uh, how we move forward. So uh, that's as hard of a deadline as we're given to give at this point uh, because, again, 
we are doing, uh, I, I believe all Yukoners are doing a fantastic job of adhering to the safe six, and that's the reason why we don't have a curve here. But as we move into next phases and next phases, what happens in British Columbia is extremely important. What happens in Alberta is extremely important. What happens in the world is extremely important. Uh, we're hearing uh, Brazil is starting to get some flares up right now, and uh, you know, in this other areas of the, of the world as well. So we have to monitor situations locally, especially with our neighboring uh, jurisdictions and, and partners. I spoke with John Horgan yesterday. Uh, they are cautiously optimistic as, as we are, uh, that our plan is, is working very well. I would say uh, outside of present company here, they have one of the best uh, chief medical officers in Canada. Uh, and, uh, and it's the work of both of these offices that are keeping us extremely safe. And it's the work of these offices that are allowing us to consider uh, a reopening as of today. We'll move now to Gabrielle, Whitehorse Star. Hi, can you give some examples of what scenarios would trigger a step backwards in this plan? Would you, <laughs> yeah, it's all written down. So as yeah. the Premier is looking it up, that I'll, I'll answer on the fly. And, and really looking for uh, basically signs of COVID coming back in. Um, so let's say we had an, had an outbreak that, uh, say a large outbreak, um, that might uh, really bring suddenly the public health um, work up to capacity and be a threat to the general public. Uh, so we might then be um, be looking at uh, having having to clamp down. Um, so there might be, uh, let's say we have uh, something else going on, another communicable disease outbreak and COVID at the same time. So maybe we'd be looking at hospital capacity being stretched uh, for, for other reasons, and then we get COVID cases on top of that. So really combinations of, of scenarios um, that would uh, stretch our capacity uh, to deal with it. Exactly. Um, in the plan, uh, there's a criteria for transitioning between phases section, and it breaks it down into uh, six different categories. Uh, and this is whether we uh, trigger uh, a movement forward to a new phase or a movement back to an existing or previous phase. Uh, one, the first one being community engagement, making sure that the community engagement piece is there as we move uh, to through these phases. Number two is preventative measures, identifying uh, outbreak in certain sectors that are not under control uh, would be a step backwards, but guidelines for uh, things happening in a positive way moving us forward. Public health capacity will be the third. Um, our ability to deal with the current situations or not be able to deal with the current situations. Uh, four, again, is that importation risk. Um, you know, if we see an upward trend in epidemiology of COVID in Canada, well, that's going to set us back. Uh, whereas if we see a downward trend uh, in the epidemiology of, of COVID in Canada, then that sets us forward. Um, health capacity is number five, and the last one, uh, six, being uh, virus spread and containment. Uh, so again, the, the, the review that we have, the, the pathway forward, it's a very comprehensive document. It has a, a lot, lots of information uh, in it, uh, not only just the phases, but uh, a, a real good sense of where we are today and where we want to be uh, into the next coming weeks and, and months. Follow-up question, Gabrielle? Yeah, and are the phases set in stone? Do they act as units, or is there a chance that elements of them could be moved forward or pushed backward, depending on how things are going? Yeah, that there. Um, it's a good question. So each each phase is kind of a package, but it does not necessarily mean that we would that all all in that package uh, needs to happen. Um, at, at the same time, um, so so there's going to be uh, some flexibility. You, you'll see that a lot of these are based on risk assessment, uh, for one thing, and some of them are based on consultations with other uh, agencies or departments. So a, an example is a lot of the school measures are going to be very closely uh, worked on with the Department of Education, um, and and so 
Um, uh, other areas will be, such as bar openings, are going to be uh, risk assessments. So we might be able to progress in other areas, but but hold off on um, on on bars, for example. Um, so really, uh, as you'll see, there are, there are some that because they're based on uh, on risk assessments or on working with other agencies, they they may uh, not necessarily all occur in, in sync. Okay, we'll move now to Chris from CBC. Thank you. Um, I guess, can you offer some clarity on what this plan means for uh, travel between communities in the Yukon? Um, we heard that this was an issue yesterday at the Yukon Forum for First Nation government. Um, so what communities can people travel to uh, now under this plan? And I guess, how do you decide uh, which places are, are okay for people to travel to? So again, uh, what I heard at the Yukon Forum yesterday, Chris, was um, that we uh, we're at a place right now with our communications, our, our weekly engagements. Uh, there are several different tables in which we are communicating, not only with our First Nations partners and governments, but also with our municipalities as well. Uh, that engagement of what's working uh, is extremely important as we move forward, not only just to phase one, but into phase two and phase three. Uh, as Dr. Hanley said last week, uh, we went from recommending to really limit your travel into the communities. Now we are looking at uh, uh, opening up the campgrounds, for example. Uh, so we're also asking Yukoners to move around a bit more. But again, we're not saying, uh, to use Brennan's word, that we're just going to throw the door wide open. Uh, again, think about why you're traveling to where you're go to to which community, uh, how important that is. But at the same time, uh, if we are opening up the campgrounds, then that means that you do have an opportunity to get out into other communities. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's now time to to hang out on Main Street uh, in in, uh, in these communities if you're not from there. Uh, it means to be very respectful. Um, and uh, we, uh, we are so, uh, we're so lucky to have the, the conduits of communication that we do have with the First Nations governments and the municipal governments and the leaders in their communities um, to have that ability to, uh, to, to see how these phases work and to see them progressing so that the triggers uh, that we... Um, that we are experiencing are communicated uh, effectively, uh, quickly, and that we can uh, ad deal with and address issues of non-compliance if, if, uh, if that so happens. Follow-up question, Chris? Um, well, okay, so, I mean, that, uh, that particular response is not very clear, to be quite honest. Um, and you've, you've just given folks a 52-page document um, with a whole bunch of uh, flow charts um, in it, uh, I, I guess, how concerned are you that um, Yukoners are going to look at this and not really be able to figure it out and just decide to do what they want? Well, the great news is we have an excellent website. So again, I'm urging everybody who's uh, looking through a pathway forward to uh, get themselves onto yukon.ca and to take a look at the guidelines that will be presented there, the operational plans, uh, but also the phone numbers that are there to uh, answer any specific questions that people have. Uh, also, the uh, COVID-19 info at uh, gov.yk.ca, also a great opportunity. We, we do recognize that this is an awful lot of information, uh, but again, Christy, be the first one to criticize us for not enough information. So what we're trying to do is we're striking a balance. Uh, we're making sure that all the information that is readily available is out there for Yukoners. We have information, uh, 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 qualification, phone lines, uh, and, uh, and email addresses. Uh, and we also have the uh, guidance of, of also the, uh, the, the communities, the First Nations partners, and the municipalities as well, helping us out to share in that information as well. Thank you. We'll move on to Jane from CBC. Hi, I'm looking at that uh, same document that Chris mentioned as well. And uh, I'm looking at the transition criteria and there are those six themes that you uh, spoke about, uh, Mr. Premier. But within the, each stage, each phase, there's multiple bullet points um, as the criteria for transition within those six themes. So do you each of those criteria need to be met to move forward to the next uh, transition phase? Like, do all of those points need to be fulfilled to transition to the next phase? And how many of those points need to, um, I guess, 
be lost uh, to trigger going backwards? Do we have to lose all of those points to move back or just one or two? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I, it's um, it's difficult to be very precise about this, and, and th these are really the criteria that we will use to make the judgment about going ahead or um, in the uh, hopefully unlikely case that we would have to go backwards. So it's just really, um, the, it, it's not that we really have a formula in mind that you have to um, to to uh, fulfill all of those. For instance, we might, uh, and as I said, I've said many times before, we uh, can expect that from time to time we will get more COVID cases. Um, as long as we're able to to maintain that containment phase, um, then we're going to be um, satisfied that w that we have the public health capacity to to carry on. It could be different combinations of um, of these factors that um, would lead us to hold tight uh, to you know to stay where we are till we get more stability more confidence uh, really with that overall framework of um, are are things um, are, are can we can we just take a little bit more time to to regain where we are y you know when even if we look at things like how do we judge importation risk um, based on the epidemiology in, south of the provinces? That's never going to be a black and white. It's going to be a, a, a kind of an evaluation. What, what if uh, what if we had large outbreaks that, that occurred in one of the major provinces? Well, we're going to look at that very closely and very carefully and see whether that is posing an additional risk for Yukon that would um, mean we'd, we'd want to stay put for longer before before we get even close to, say, uh, having more exceptions for who may be allowed in for from Yukon. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, um, you know, the decisions being made by the, the government, uh, Yukon government, to move into next phases will absolutely be uh, guided by the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Of health. Uh, on a weekly basis, we have check-ins from uh, uh, Dermot and his team, uh, John Stryker, Minister Stryker and his team, uh, you know, Pauline Frost, Minister Frost and Health and Social Services, uh, Tracy McPhee, our Attorney General and her team, uh, Legal, uh, Ranch Palais and Jeannie Dendies on the economic front as well. Uh, and we also have the, uh, the Chief's uh, engagement that we do in the municipality as well. Um, it, it's a lot of oversight uh, for sure. Uh, the triggers, the criteria that you mentioned, uh, those are our guiding principles. Th those are the, uh, the things that we have to consider we have to look at uh, as all of these uh, groups as we get together on a weekly basis to see how we're doing. Um, you know, there, there's definitely, uh, there's, there's no mold, I guess, per se, but there is an awful lot of uh, very well-intentioned and well-educated people that are monitoring the situation, making sure that our number one goal of not having a curve and not having a strain on our medical community uh, is, is still uh, a reality. Uh, and with our second goal of, of making sure for the mental wellness and the social wellness and the economic benefits of Yukoners that we are able to move more freely um, around the Yukon and to have an economy. Thank you. Next question, Jane. Um, I have a, a follow-up question here. Um, based on phase one uh, restart, which is the, the current phase we're in, it says for indoor public recreation centers and libraries, uh, restrictions may be eased based on public health assessment, strict infection prevention and control measures, and an operating plan will be required. So I know we, we talked a lot about um, business today, having operating plans. Um, are, is there any chance that we'll see libraries reopening in this phase anytime soon or recreation centers like the Canada Game Center? Yes. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, if we look at Canada Game Center, f for instance, that is something we're very interested in working with the city on. It, um, and uh, I, th I think I've men mentioned before, but you know, obviously there are a lot of complexities to that. So it's it's not something that you can simply um, simply open from one day to the next. But it may in itself need phases of of, of reopening or certain areas to be reopened. And then it's you know working with the city for. How, how will that be uh, actually operationalized? So definitely something that, that uh, we, we are very interested in working with the, uh, with the city on. Um, and we have been working with uh, some of the communities on recreation uh, facilities in, in the communities already. 
Um, and and similarly with the uh, with the library, we're, we're very interested in working um, with uh, with our partners uh, to um, to look at uh, um, library reopening uh, again, and just um, w as, as working together through the criteria needed to uh, to do that safely. Thank you. We'll move now to Chuck from Shown FM. Chuck? We'll move on and come back. We'll go to Gord from Yukon News. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sorry, who do we have? It's Chuck. Sorry, uh, good afternoon, Dr. <laughs> at uh, Premier Silver. Uh, not being privy to the Yukon Forum yesterday uh, and uh, the, the previous day, I'm just wondering, with the self-governing First Nations that uh, do have states of emergency, uh, what would your advice to them be? Should they uh, stay with the status quo or perhaps with the evolving phases uh, look at changing their situation? Uh, great, great question, Chuck. Um, based upon the conversations we had at the forum, but also the the individual conversations that I've had with uh, with the individual chiefs on phone calls and texts, um, I I am uh, pleased that each of those governments are following the recommendations from the chief medical office of me medical uh, office. Um, I know, for example, uh, Nashad Ahene uh, in uh, in Tesla and Klinka Council, uh, they are uh, moving forward on a plan to reopen. Uh, they provided that plan to uh, to Dr. Hanley's uh, uh, office, uh, keeping in close contact uh, to make sure that uh, uh, that again, all governments are moving based upon the best scientific um, and uh, and public health uh, information possible as we move together forward. Next question, Chuck. Uh, Champagne Asiac. Yes. So, with Champagne and Asiac and Old Crow, have they discussed any uh, plans similar to that of Peslin? Yeah, so again, not to be able to speak on behalf of those First Nations governments, those are great questions for Chief Smith and Chief Tizia Tram. Uh, again, great conversations from those leaders um, as we had uh, our Yukon Forum yesterday. Uh, and uh, again, from what I'm hearing at the Yukon Forum and from my conversations and uh, Minister Frost's conversations, uh, we're all pretty much in lockstep that, uh, that the best pathway forward for our elders and for our most vulnerable people in the communities that don't have as much access access to uh, public health and that you would have in a, in a major center is that we follow the advice of the public health authorities and I am confident that all of the uh, municipal and, uh, and, uh, and First Nations and territorial governments here in Yukon are, are, are exactly uh, doing that. Thank you. We'll move now to Gord at Yukon News. Yes, I'm just looking to build off of uh, Jane's question. Uh, was the CGC actually ordered to close? Um, so my um, what what happened was that there was a, a decision. There wasn't a direct order for CGC to close, but a decision after after some conversations with city officials, a decision made by the city to close just because of difficulties complying with the public health requirements, um, such as uh, the uh, you, you know handling the numbers of people and being able to um, observe um, either heightened uh, sanitation um, requirements or. Or uh, the contact, the, the physical distancing requirements. Um, so, um, so a lot of complexities, especially having to make decisions in, in a short uh, time, as we were um, in the times of declaring the public health emergency. Um, so that was, let's say, it was a mutual decision rather than a than, than a direct order. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very good question for, for example, uh, businesses that uh, didn't have to shut down but decided to shut down. Um, if you weren't in that group of businesses that were ordered to shut, uh, and if you just made the decision that you're going to take some time, um, again, as far as reopening, you don't have to have that reopening plan 
as of right now. It's something you need to work on. And uh, Dr. Hanley said the date of by the end of the month uh, to have those uh, those in, in place. However, if you were in that ca category of businesses that were mandated to close, before you open, you need to have the operational plan in place. I know that's a little bit confusing, uh, but again, all of that information is is well laid out at yukon.ca. So whether or not you are, uh, you know, the uh, the organizers at the Canada Game Center uh, or a business that wasn't ordered to shut down but did shut down uh, and wanting to reopen uh, soon, uh, or a, one that was mandated to shut down, uh, your your lanes, I guess we can say, are all going to be very well defi defi defined uh, in the coming days. Uh, we've the team has worked extremely hard to get to where we are right now with uh, showing you Connors what the path forward is uh, today's the day that we start that new phase and in the coming days and weeks we will uh, we will be working with our stakeholders in each of these categories to make sure that their transition back to uh, back to an economy uh, back to pro pro programs and services is uh, is expedited as quickly as possible thank you next question Gord now, understanding this will be at the, I guess, the mercy of, uh, we'll call it Mother Nature, for lack of a better term, how long would you estimate Phase 1 would last? Oh, geez, uh, that's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good question. I, I appreciate that that's a, a concern of everybody's. Um, there's just so many variables uh, at play uh, for, that, for that answer. Uh, the best that I can say right now is, um, let's say we have a, a, a very smooth transition locally in getting uh, operational plans submitted um, and, and getting folks up and running into phase one. Then we have to wait, uh, you know, that, that, that two uh, to, to four week period. Uh, to make sure nothing bad happens, make sure that uh, the, the six categories of triggers that we're looking at are, are positively affected as opposed to negatively affected. Uh, but, but there is a two to four week minimum uh, once we get things in place uh, where we absolutely will need uh, that time uh, to look at the epidemiology. Yeah, I might just, I, I agree. Uh, so, so that's why I, I really emphasize that we we commit the time frame to more of the transition period between phases, but not commit to a time period for each phase. Um, I mean, in reality, we're looking at anywhere from weeks to months per phase. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I think the first phase is a is a really big uh, step. Um, it's, uh, um, it it in itself, as the Premier said, is not everything happening on, on day one. It's, it's going to take a couple of weeks even for everything in phase one to be kind of clarified and, and, and to be realized and operationalized and, and probably weeks beyond that. So uh, it's, uh, it's a progressive uh, phase. And once we're in a... Um, once we have all of these uh, these businesses that want to be up and running, uh, up and running and, and and doing well and confident, then we're in a kind of a consolidation phase. Consol just like we have been consolidating this this previous phase of the of the where we are, where we have been in the, the 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 phase zero or the current state, we need to consolidate that phase, and then contemplate going going ahead into the uh, subsequent phase through a transition period into phase two. We'll move now to Julien Roboreal. Julien? Oui, désolé. Euh, merci. Donc, ma question est pour euh, Monsieur Hendley. Donc, je me demandais si c'était possible de répondre en français. Pourquoi c'est difficile de donner des périodes de temps ou des dates claires euh, pour euh, les phases, malgré la présence d'un plan? The question is for Dr. Hanley. Uh, given what you have said at this point, can you repeat in French why it would be difficult to give a definite dates or a definite periods of time to go from one phase to another one? Oui, donc ce serait um, similaire de ce que j'ai déjà parlé, mais mais traduit en français. Donc c'est ça, ça prend un bon moment uh, juste pour réaliser uh, tous les um, 
euh, toutes les opérations euh, de consolider euh, où on est dans la, dans la première phase. Donc, la première étape, euh, ça va prendre au moins quelques semaines, euh, sinon des mois, euh, pour vraiment être euh, pour pour parce qu'il y a tellement pour pour arriver des entreprises euh, des, des 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 commerces des services personnels euh, donc beau, euh, beaucoup des établissements pour réouvrir et pour rétablir les, leurs services que ça va prendre un temps que c'est difficile à, à devenir au même temps on a aussi euh, euh, il, il faut avoir les, euh, la confiance pour, pour être dans, de continuer dans un bon état vis-à-vis -vis la COVID-19. Donc, c'est, c'est pour, pour assurer la balance. Et donc, quand tout est bien établi, on est, on sera dans une position de contempler la, la prochaine étape, la, 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 la prochaine, euh, prochaine étape euh, avec euh, phase 2. Donc, euh, oui, c'est pour ça, c'est difficile à dire. Euh, on, on voit euh, que euh, entre des semaines et des mois pour chaque phase, pour chaque étape, et deux, entre deux et quatre semaines pour la transition euh, une à l'autre. As-tu une autre question, Julien oui, merci. Euh, ma question, je pense qu'elle peut s'adresser à M. Sandy Silver. Euh, C'est sûr qu'en ce moment, l'été approche très vite et je désire un peu plus de clarté pour savoir si, par exemple, les temps de jour euh, qui doivent bientôt rentrer en opération doivent, ont une date limite pour fournir leur plan opérationnel pour la reprise des activités. So the question is for the Premier. Uh, given that summer is coming really quickly, uh, Do you have an idea of dates for uh, day camps, for example, to submit their plans so that they can be open in the summer? Yeah, so no, no specific dates right now, but as I mentioned in, in uh, my uh, speech to begin with, uh, Dr. Hanley's team is working on uh, on those provisions uh, as, as we speak, basically, and, and those, uh, those should be ready uh, early this week coming up. Yeah. Oui, je, je peux ajouter que on a déjà reçu des applications et des plans pour les camps de, de pour les, les camps d'activité. Donc c'est ça c'est uh, déjà un processus. Ce qu'on n'est on n'est pas encore uh, prêt pour les les camps de um, comment dire les, les camps de plusieurs jours, mais le camp de jour, uh, on est uh, c'est effectivement c'est déjà ouvert. On, on est déjà en, en, en train de faire de approuver ou d'aviser de, de, sur les plans pour les, uh, pour les, les camps différents. Thank you. Should I? I I'll just Would say that, say that I quickly? just said that we're already receiving uh, applications for for camps and reviewing uh, reviewing day camp applications. We're not in a position to approve overnight camps at this point, but we uh, through our what we call the RAD, which is um, risk assessment. Risk assessment decision, decision uh, uh, team that where we are looking at uh, applications and, and giving advice and approving, improving them for the summer camps. Thank you. We'll move now to Nick from Canadian Press. Uh, nothing from me. Thank you. Claudiane, Radio Canada. Oui, euh, juste euh, pour euh, savoir, il y a eu beaucoup de plaintes par rapport à un manque de consultation, que c'est une des premières nations, du secteur privé, même de certains organismes comme euh, les garderies. En allant de l'avant, a ton intention de, de consulter davantage les gens avant de passer à une nouvelle phase? So at this point, there was a lot of consultation, discussions with different groups, retailers, First Nation, uh, and uh, the question is, are we going to have more of these consultations uh, as we are moving from one phase to another one? Uh, absolutely, Claudian. Um, you know, it's... Imagine back uh, a couple of months ago before any of this, uh, none of these... Um, you know, COVID-specific uh, conduits were, were in place. 
Uh, however, um, you know, a whole government approach uh, that we've been uh, developing over the last few years is so instrumental into our ability to to uh, to use that approach uh, for COVID-related issues. The Yukon Forum, having uh, all of the different 16 different working groups, uh, JSEC, uh, all the fantastic work that the Association of Yukon Communities does, you know, all of those conduits communications being up and running before COVID were instrumental. Uh, and then uh, to have uh, everybody mm -hmm. come to together. Um, you know, we didn't get it perfect from the, from the get-go, but uh, what I did notice at every turn was uh, whether it's uh, Dr. Hanley's team or, uh, or health and social services or the folks that are implementing the, the emergency measures, uh, Dermot and his team, uh, everybody, uh, you know, Jeff Ford working upstairs in executive council for my team with, uh, with his crew, everybody's so willing to, uh, to take uh, what we've learned on a weekly basis and, and apply it to a new normal. Uh, it, we would uh, be remiss if we went from this uh, backwards. Uh, we now have these these conduits. Uh, we have uh, excellent partners in the community. Uh, our, our, you know, it's, it's just an amazing place to be right now, all of the different conversations that are happening. Uh, I would have thought by now that people would have been burnt out, but what I see, whether it's in First Nations governments, municipal governments, the chief medical office, uh, ECO, all of the departments, uh, everybody is attuned to the important work that we're doing. And, uh, and post-COVID, when that reality comes, uh, this will make us stronger. We will be better as a society because we have created so many pockets of communication through these trying times. And I know they are stressful and trying times, um, but uh, I'm surrounded by a bunch of hardworking optimists uh, that make my job easier uh, in these uneasy times. Merci. Et je, je vais juste ajouter... Um uh, que Claudienne, que c'est, uh, à, à mon avis, uh, c'est fondamental de continuer les conversations um, um, avec, avec tous ces groupes que le premier a, a mentionné, um, mais aussi pour répéter que il y a des critères, des, des sept critères, je, je crois, pour continuer. Um, uh, par exemple, de maintenir les mesures pub publiques, uh, de, la cap de, de, de entretenir la, la capacité de santé publique, la capacité de, de réponse uh, aux, um, aux éclosions, um, la, la capacité de dépistage. Mais entre ces critères, c'est l'engagement uh, communautaire. Donc, c'est fondamental pour continuer uh, de, de réussir. Thank you. Prochaine question, Claudiane. Oui, dans la même veine, là, M. Tarenli, euh, dans quelle mesure est-ce que vous allez être capable d'ajuster de, de, euh, les euh, lignes directrices d'opération aux réalités de chaque organisme? Par exemple, s'il y a un camp de vacances et euh, dans une position particulière, dans quelle mesure êtes-vous capable de pouvoir ajouter des lignes directrices pour cet organisme-là, pour ce commerce-là, en tout particulier. The question is for Dr. Henley. Uh, to what extent are you going to be able to adjust the guidelines for specific circumstances of these different organizations? Uh, how far can you go into looking at individuals and saying that you can adjust the guidelines for each one of them? C'est une très bonne question um, et ça dépend de, de, le, uh, de la catégorie uh, d'établissement. Et donc, c'est important de, de, de distinguer, de, de différencier entre, par exemple, les établissements qui sont sous l'acte de loi santé publique, par exemple, les services personnels. Donc, uh, mais on, on sait en même temps que c'est pas pratique de juger chacun individuellement au même temps. Donc, on a formé le plan de recevoir les plans et pour avoir un système rapide pour approuver les plans qui, qui effectivement, tous les éléments des plans sont, sont fournis. 
sont euh, et, et donc pour euh, pour dire un, un rapide euh, turnaround pour ces euh, ces demandes ch chaque par chaque euh, mais aussi mais, mais pour l'inspection les, les, plus détaillée ça peut on, on reconnaît que ça va prendre le temps mais et donc ça peut arriver dans les semaines qui viennent selon la capacité de l'inspection euh, euh, de santé environnementale Uh, mais sans limiter la capacité pour l'établissement d'ouvrir. Uh, mais pour les, uh, pour les autres uh, endroits, comme les entreprises qui ne sont pas sous l'acte de loi, ils sont, ils, ils sont ouverts, ils, ben, ils, ils, ils sont, uh, on a la confiance uh, uh, de, pour eux de suivre les... Uh, suivre les uh, les, les guides qui sont là, euh, disponibles, euh, euh, mais avec la possibilité d'avoir une inspection euh, sans avis. De, donc, uh, I, I was saying that the, that, that the question was about um, the, yeah, can we keep up basically with the capacity to, to follow individually how each establishment is, is, maintain, is able to comply. And it really depends on those that are under the Public Health and Safety Act, which do require an inspection, but we have a mechanism for assuring a quick turnaround. May, have your plan, submit your plan. We will, through the HEOC, make sure that plan is is complete and looks looks good. Then we can tick it off rapidly, allow the business to get established, and then an inspection process can occur in the weeks to come, but without holding up the ability of that, um, a per, for instance, a restaurant or personal care service to open. Um, but for the general retail that are not under the Act, they there are guidelines available. It's up to them to comply with the guidelines, and they can be then. They need to have their plan submitted to uh, uh, workers um, or WCB, but without having to wait for specific approval. But again, subject to inspection by uh, WCB down the line. So hopefully, that combination between efficiency, not holding up processes, but compliance with the safety requirements. Thank you. We had committed to a second round of questions. I will call your name. You will be given the opportunity for one question, no follow-up. If you have no questions, please let me know. Tim, CKRW. Hi, uh, my question is for Dr. Hanley, and it pertains to dine-in restaurants. Uh, just reading here on the on the 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 plan, uh, dine-in restaurants cannot operate until the CMOH lifts the order. Guidelines are published and the operational plan is approved. So when are you, is this individual orders? Is this an overall order? And when, uh, when do restaurants uh, who are dining only get those guidelines? So four elements really, order, guideline, plans, inspection. So the order will be the general order that, that, can, be, um, that can be lifted and that will, uh, that, that will be soon. I, 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 that really depends on cabinet, so I, can't, I, I obviously can't commit, but, but within the very near future. Um, the, the guideline uh, is being finalized as we speak, so I expect the guideline to be available by early, uh, probably uh, into, into next week. Um, the, uh, and then the restaurant makes their operating plan based on the guideline, submits it. Um, when it's been submitted and we see that the guideline is um, uh, complied with in the plan, that, it re that the plan reflects what is needed in the guideline, we then 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 the, the go ahead for that restaurant to open will be given um, and then as I said the inspection is the the, the last thing so that we're not holding them to the inspection before they um, reopen but they will be subject to inspection um, according to the schedule of the environmental health officers and just on the, on the cabinet aspect of that uh, Tim uh, that's early next week Thank you. We'll move to Gabrielle, Whitehorse Star. Hi. Looking at the charts in the path forward document, it looks as though most businesses will follow um, the reopening plan that they're working on now until a vaccine is available. Can you just confirm that I've read that correctly? And so does that mean business owners need to look at a longer-term lens of perhaps 12 to 18 months 
until a vaccine is available when they're working on these plans. Yeah, so, so I, I think what you're looking at is the, the, the line that probably says continued, continued, continued through the different phases. Mm -hmm. So um, it really means, so, so the expectation is that the, the, the workplace, um, the requirements to operate under physical distancing uh, for really as the fundamental, the fundamental component of this for workplaces, uh, apart from things like, um, you know, uh, limiting customers and enhanced sanitation. It's really all about maintaining safe spacing within the workplace for, for staff and customers or clients. Um, and so, yes, so if your question is, is that what we expect until we get to vaccine, then yes, that, that will be the, the um, expectation. Um, because in, until we get to um, that scenario of vaccine available and into arms, uh, then uh, we're not going to be in a low-risk uh, COVID uh, situation in the country. The only alternative might be um, having, if we don't get to a successful vaccine, that uh, obviously we will have to look at other strategies. One of them would be effective treatments available so that COVID is no longer the threat that it currently is. Thank you. We'll move to Chris at CBC. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Premier, as you're probably aware, uh, the opposition parties co-signed a letter yesterday to you uh, asking for you to recall the Legislative Assembly uh, to talk about uh, the government's measures uh, to combat COVID-19. Um, I, I also understand that uh, the opposition parties uh, say that um, the government is now ignoring their request uh, to talk about uh, making arrangements to have uh, meetings about this. So do you want to, I guess, uh, I just take this opportunity to answer the opposition's questions uh, if there is going to be a sitting in the Legislative Assembly, and uh, if not, why not? Uh, good question, Chris. So, again, we made a uh, commitment uh, that the uh, departments would be available for the critics uh, to do the scrutiny of the uh, departments for the budget that we passed, uh, and we unanimously passed that budget uh, in the fall. Um, the opposition, uh, whether or not they take us up on that offer, that's up to them, but that is the offer for the current budget. Uh, when it comes to COVID expenses, it's like wildland fire management uh, in the fire season where uh, we have fires uh, burning late. Uh, it's a regular process to tally all of those emergency expenses. And in the fall, we will also absolutely uh, have the opportunity for the critics to do their job and to do the scrutiny of every single budgetary item uh, COVID related. So we have two opportunities that we are uh, uh, allowing, uh, offering uh, for the opposition, whether they choose to take it or not for the, uh, the offer in May for the current budget, that's up to them. Jane, CBC. I'm wondering how long will it take to, uh, for these businesses to develop the operational plans uh, if we're still, the guidelines are being developed. There are some guidelines available yeah, well, now. So how, uh, how, how long will it, we, how long will it take for those businesses? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, Jane, we're having some difficulty with your call. Uh, uh, sorry, there's someone else talking at the same yeah. time. If folks can mute their phones. Can people please mute their phones? Uh, so I'm just wondering how long will it take for the businesses to uh, develop so, their uh, operational plan, uh, 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 get those approved, and then reopen? I'm not sure if you can hear me. We can. Again, can people please mute their phones if they're not asking a question? Okay. The, uh, okay. Do you know who that is? Who's the, uh, on that line? Is there a Yeah, would you? S'il vous plaît, le, oui. si vous pouvez euh, si, silencer votre téléphone, on, euh, on voudrait continuer avec notre euh, conversation ici. Alors, le monsieur qui parle en français. Oui, merci. Tu peux me texter. Non, non. Okay. <laughs> I don't think he hears me. Oh, I don't think he hears you either. Okay. <laughs> oh. Thank you. There you go. He finished his call. So, sorry, Jane, can you give I us that one more time? Uh, sorry. Of course. Just wondering, 
How long will it take for these businesses? Uh, it sounds like there are some guidelines that are still being developed. How long will it take for the operational plans to um, be approved uh, and then businesses to reopen? How Do you have a, a sense of how long that process might be? I, I think we're we're well prepared. Um, you know, we had a similar concern uh, in in the previous weeks of uh, you know businesses coming to us that uh, didn't have to close but did uh, to kind of wrap their heads around uh, the the uh, the requirements. Uh, and so in that time, we have established phone lines and and information uh, uh, email addresses that type of thing. So we've been working on the mechanisms uh, of that uh, for quite some time now. Uh, I think we have that all up and running very well now so that we expect uh, a big surge uh, in that capacity. Uh, the phone lines, we heard today that they were at about our ability to answer those questions as, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and like, uh, I, like uh, Dr. Hanley said, he's prioritizing the, the operational plans um, and making sure that we, we get those out the door uh, as quickly as possible with our teams. Uh, and uh, so I think we're well suited. Um, we won't know uh, how quickly until we start that process, though. So uh, we, we believe we're well suited to be ready. Um, it's anyone's guess right now, though, as far as how quickly that's going to get expedited next week. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, Schoen? No, I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gord, Yukon News? I'm curious, since uh, a fall session was mentioned at this point, uh, do we know if the uh, fall, se fall session will go ahead as planned? Uh, yep. <laughs> well, I, we we hope. Uh, I'd like again, that is uh, that's October uh, from now. Uh, so you know, all things considered, uh, COVID related. Um, but uh, you know, we we would be confident uh, in in that there are uh, regular dates for our fall session, and uh, we hope that uh, COVID doesn't does not interfere with that. But uh, I, I think by by uh, by all accounts, uh, that should be on schedule. Thank you. Julien, Arboreal? Non, pas de questions, merci. Merci. Nick, Canadian Press? No, we'll move on. Claudienne? Oui, uh, Premier, how much has this pandemic cost so far, and how much are you anticipating it will cost uh, in the coming months? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, Claudia. Uh, you know, as, as far as uh, dollars uh, for our programs uh, to date, uh, the Yukon government's uh, uh, spending, we are just under the two, uh, $27 million uh, mark. Um, there, there's a bigger philosophical conversation about the mental uh, costs, the mental health costs, uh, those types of things, and, and a bigger conversation as well about the economic costs of our businesses and our communities. Uh, you know, so you know, direct cost to our government as far as incentives um, is reaching a, around $27 million. We, we do have, Claudia, a list of all of the uh, initiatives so far uh, in the plan uh, from our government. Uh, you know, if you add into that as well our portion of federal funding, you know, you get up there into uh, uh, quite another uh, larger number as far as the, the actual fiscal costs between our two governments. Um, talking to the First Nations governments as well uh, about their accommodations and municipal governments as well, there's a cost there. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, yeah, it's definitely unprecedented at times. It's, uh, it's something that we will be uh, calculating the all the costs of uh, for weeks and, and, and months and years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Silver. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. A reminder that we will not be updating the COVID-19 results over the weekend. The next update online will be on Tuesday, May 19th, to coincide with our COVID-19 update at 2 p.m. Thank you.